Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. Welcome to another recent reads video. I feel like it has not been that long since my last one, but I've somehow accumulated more books to talk about. So here we are today and we're going to talk about um, some books I've read recently that I haven't really talked about or I haven't given you final thoughts on yet um, in my reading vlogs. And so without further ado, let's jump right into it. Um, I did separate them into like genres sort of. Um, so I will make sure to leave timestamps down below in case you want to skip ahead. Um, but I'm going to start off with some DNFs. The first book I DNFed is very much a, not even a booktube fave, but just like a book that everyone has been reading and loving and that is I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy. Um, I quite honestly got swept up into the hype. I was not planning on reading this. I don't know who Jeanette McCurdy is. Like I never watched whatever show it was that she was on. And in general celebrity memoirs are not really my thing which is kind of ironic to say because I actually did read another celebrity memoir but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so anyway point is this book was just not for me. I DNF this about halfway through I think or just under halfway through and it was unfortunately just a situation where I totally knew going into the book or I should have known reasonably that it was not going to be for me. I think for me I appreciated what she was saying and I appreciated her like telling her story so to speak but I found a lot of the memoir or at least the first half that I read was very much focused around the auditioning process and it was just for me that's not something that I'm very interested in and I just found it to be a book that was for me personally not that engaging and again like I feel bad saying that I DNF'd a memoir because of course this is her story and I think that it is great that it is out in the world but it just unfortunately didn't really work for me but again it, this is still a book that I'd say if you are interested in her story if you are interested in what she has to say I think it is still worth picking up. The second book I DNF'd is another kind of favorite here on booktube uh, and that is Delilah Green Doesn't Care by Ashley Herring Blake. I read maybe about a third of the book um, and I just didn't like this to be quite honest with you. With romances I just find it difficult to read a romance if I don't root for the couple and this was not a couple that I rooted for. If you don't know what the setup of this book is basically we follow two main characters Delilah and I don't even remember the other girl's name but basically Delilah is a photographer I believe some sort of artist and she lives in like the city New York City probably I don't even remember um, but she is from a small town and her stepsister is getting married um, and her stepsister and her stepmother are paying her a lot of money to be their designated photographer for the entire week um, and she doesn't really want to go home because she has a lot of trauma um, from her childhood. Her father died when she was really young and so like she didn't really feel like she got the support from her stepmother or or her stepsister growing up and her stepsister Astrid and like her little posse of friends like bullied her growing up and so like she just doesn't like going back home. She doesn't have a relationship with this stepsister of hers. And the romance is between her and one of um, Astrid's friends. The one, one of the ones that used to like bully her as a kid. And for me, I just like, I have absolutely no interest in this like bully redemption arc romance whatsoever, uh, quite frankly. I find Astrid and her friends incredibly irritating, incredibly annoying, um, and honestly just kind of mean. Like their little like mean girls posse is not, is not it. And I found it very like unmotivating to continue to read Delilah Green knowing that the second book in the series is about Astrid. And I'm just like, I don't care. I quite frankly don't care. And like, I just knew that if I continued reading, it would probably end up being like two stars. Uh, aside from the romance issues though, I also didn't really like the writing that much. I found the dialogue to be very, very childish, juvenile. Is that rude to say? I don't know. I just found it very cringy and I think it was even more jarring because the blurb of this book literally calls this book steamy and first of all in the entire first third of the book I do not find this book steamy whatsoever. Maybe there's like more steam later on. I don't know. But for a book described as steamy it is absolutely not in my opinion based on the first third of the book and also again if you're describing a book as steamy but like all the dialogue is extremely childish like I just I, it, it creates like this weird disconnect for me and it was just not for me. It was just, this book was just not for me. The last book that I DNF'd in this period of time is The Art of Prophecy by Wesley Chu and I'm really disappointed that I ended up DNFing this because I was buddy reading this with my friend Jesse from Bowties and Books and I think they actually ended up really liking it. I really enjoyed part one of this book. If you watch some of my vlogs where I read this you'll actually see that I had very positive things to say about this book. It is a very classic wuxia 
tale in that we are following a character who is prophesized to be kind of like the savior of this country and it's very interesting because he's basically had this entire religion built around him but we find out very quickly that he's basically a spoiled brat <laughs> he has a lot of like natural talent to become like a martial arts lord um but he has just been spoiled his whole life he's had so many different like mentors in his life that he has yet to master anything. And then we get introduced to this kind of like old lady character who is a martial arts master. And she basically comes in and she's like, you're shit. And basically she like is like, all of you fired. I'm going to whip you back up into shape. Um, and that's kind of the premise of kind of like the first part of this book. And it's really fun. I think it's really fun. And I think what it does to turn some of the very classic wuxia tropes on its head is very, very interesting. However, some Something happens at the end of part one, which I obviously don't want to say because I think it's a spoiler, but something happens at the end of part one, which has so much potential and it's so interesting. But then it goes into part two and part two is such a drastic shift in tone, in pacing, in everything. And honestly, I just got bored. I got to about halfway through this book and it is a chunky book. And so I just like didn't really want to invest much more time into it. Um, to be quite honest with you, I think that if you enjoy Wuxia and you are like willing to kind of trudge through the middle section of this book, uh, maybe I'd recommend it. The other problem I had was that there's actually like two other, I think, female POVs and like neither of them are distinguishable. And I just didn't really know what they were doing there. I didn't really understand their whole storyline, what the point was. This is a book that I feel like maybe one day once the entire saga is like complete and I can see where the end goal is, I might return to this because I do feel like wuxia is one of those genres where it does take time to kind of build up political tensions and all that kind of stuff. But for me, like there's just no incentive to continue on in this book at this point. Um, I will say if you do read this, I do recommend the audiobook by Natalie Nottis. Um, she is, of course, fantastic. And I think that she does a lot to bring this book to life. And when I switched to audio, I actually listened to the book quite a bit more than I probably would have if I was just reading it. Um, but yeah, all in all, I'm a little disappointed that I didn't like love this book. Um, but it is what it is. And we are moving on. The next section are romances. I read four romances recently that I want to talk about. The first romance that I read was A Marvelous Light. This is a kind of like historical regency type um, of fantasy romance between this magician guy and then this like non-magician guy. To be quite honest with you, I remember very little about this book. I think it is largely unmemorable. I had a good time while I was reading it, but I literally retained nothing from this book. Like a day after I read it, I forgot half the book already. I think I gave it three stars in the end, and I think that's where I stand on it as well. It is enjoyable. I think that a lot of people really love it. From what I remember though, um, the most interesting thing I think was the magic system. The magic system is based on Cat's Cradle and like light, and I think that that is really interesting. I just thought it was like really fun. And then the romance, one of the characters who is like, who has magic, he's like very closed off, guarded, grumpy, if you will. Um, and I really liked him. I liked his character, I remember. The other character, basically what happens to him is that he ends up getting this like curse on his arm. And so they need to work together to break this curse. He's not magical though. He didn't even know magic existed until the start of this book. It is a fun time, I think, if you enjoy kind of like these sorts of like Victorian romances, Regency romances. I don't know. I really don't know my like historical English eras at all. But I think if you enjoy that type of drama, like being in a manor house, like family drama, like that kind of thing, I think you might like this. The next romance I read was Always Only You by Chloe Lise. I believe this is the second book in like the series where they follow a different brother in each series, but I don't think it matters, whatever. Um, and this is a romance between a hockey player and the manager of the team. Like she's like their PR manager type of thing. And I really like this. I think I gave it 3.25 stars in the end. I really enjoyed most of it. And it was like looking to be a four stars for most of it. But then the third act breakup happened. And the third act conflict of this book is 
so bad, quite frankly, so bad. And I think that it's not bad in the sense that like it's unrealistic or whatever, but it's bad in the sense that like it really changed the relationship dynamics to me. And for me, I'm like, I don't know how you came back from that in two seconds. Um, and so like that just really ruined the relationship for me, unfortunately. And so I did bump it down in the end, but I did for the most part really enjoy this. He is kind of like that, like, you know, big, burly, lumberjack kind of character, but he has, like, a heart of gold, and he's, like, actually, like, a cinnamon roll and adorable. Um, and then the main female character, I've forgotten her name now, um, but she is autistic, and she, um, suffers from chronic pain due to, uh, arthritis. So I actually really enjoyed, um, the representation there, and also discussing how she navigates relationships, um, with both her chronic pain and, um, her autism. And so I thought that was really interesting. And I believe the author is neurodivergent as well. So I think that this is coming at least to a certain extent from a lived experience, which I do prefer. And overall, again, I would recommend this book. I actually really, really enjoyed this. And I will definitely be checking out more from Chloe Lise in the future. I don't know if I'll be checking out more in this series. Um, I'll have to figure out like what the tropes are. This one definitely is a bit of like a grumpy sunshine dynamic, which I really like, but it is also like a coworker dynamic, which I normally don't like, but I actually quite liked how it was handled in this book and I thought it was really well done. The next romance that I read was Zenny by Rebecca Weatherspoon. I really enjoyed this. I think I gave this 3.5 stars, maybe a little bit higher. I don't know. I definitely rounded it up to four though. But this is a romance that I've always heard Mina from Mina Reads talk about. Um, and I've always been really interested in it because it has bi representation in it. Like both main characters are bisexual. And basically it's about this woman, Zenny. Um, her aunt recently passed away. And basically the details are a bit like fuzzy in my head. But if I remember correctly, in order to inherit whatever, like the estate, the money, um, she needs to enter into this like fake marriage with this like Scottish dude that her aunt was kind of like, not mentoring, but like kind of took under her wing a little bit. Um, and basically it's about their fake marriage. Um, I really enjoyed this. I felt like it was not insta-love per se, but it was very much like, oh, like right from the get go, like we're obviously two attractive people and like there's no like beating around the bush. Like I really enjoyed that. Like they were, their banter, I really, really enjoyed. I will say the one thing that I really didn't like about this book, again, is the third act breakup. This was really like just such a nonsensical, it made no sense. Like the logic was not there for this breakup. Um, so that was kind of annoying. But I will say the sex scenes in this book, chef's kiss, amazing. Men getting pegged. Love it. I love it. But I also will say that I do want to put a content warning on this because I think I didn't expect it going in. But this book definitely does deal quite heavily with themes of grief, especially the loss of um, a family member and the loss of like a parental type figure. Um, so I think that if that is something that you might find triggering, definitely don't go into this book um, if you're not in the right headspace for it. I think I definitely was not quite in the right headspace and it made me feel a little weird at times because of that. I don't think it impacted my enjoyment, but it's definitely just something I wanted to mention um, in case that is a trigger for you. And then the last romance that I read recently is Soulmates by Susan Lee. This is a YA contemporary romance between this Korean American girl um, who basically hates all things Korean because she has like rejected her Korean identity her entire life and her childhood best friend who went back to Korea became like a really popular um, K-drama actor um, and he comes back to America for like the summer and they get to know each other again. Um, that's kind of like the overall premise of this book. I really enjoyed this book for the most part. Again, I think that it was a very fun time. Um, I've actually seen a lot of reviews of this on Goodreads comparing it like to XOXO by Axio and also Once Upon a K-Prom by Kat Cho. Um, and interestingly, most of the reviews say that they think that this is uh, a less good version of those. And I wholly disagree with that. And while I don't think I loved this book, I think I gave it like three stars in the end. Um, I actually think this was a lot better executed than either of those books. I think in particular compared to XOXO, um, which is one of my worst books of last year, um, I hated how many topics XOXO tried to cover. And it very much felt like I was reading a recap of a book versus actually reading a book. And I liked that in Soulmates, Susan Lee focused on one or two themes. And really it was like four the 
female main character, it was coming to terms and like connecting with her roots and her culture and, and coming to terms with kind of the internalized um, hatred that she has. I, I really liked that theme. And then for him, it was really that theme of like finding your freedom and finding your voice. And I really did appreciate that there was like this focus on these two themes um, rather than trying to do everything all at once. And I really, really enjoyed that part of it. Um, the relationship was cute. I do like a good friends to lovers, so I, I thought that was really cute. The third act breakup, though, this was truly, truly an offensive third act breakup because there were approximately three of them, and all of them were about the same thing. So they would, like, argue about one thing, they would, like, talk about it, resolve it, and I was like, amazing. And then they would have the same fight again, and then they would resolve it, and then they would have the same fight again and resolve it. And I'm like, I get that they're teenagers, but, like, I don't need to see this conversation and this argument play out three times. It was just like very repetitive. Um, so I didn't really like that. But aside from that, I did think this was fun. I think that if you enjoy these type of like K-drama type of um, YAs, I think you will really enjoy this one. Um, and I do recommend this one. I've been talking for way too long, so let's move on. The next section is nonfiction, and for this I only have one book, and that is We Were Dreamers by Simu Liu. And this is, of course, his memoir. I think I read this in, like, one day, so I did, you know, to an extent, enjoy this. I did listen to the audiobook for this one, um, and I did really enjoy his narration of, of course, his own story. I think what I liked most about this memoir is... Um, he talks a lot about his parents' life as well and how um, they ended up immigrating to Canada. And I thought that that was really important in terms of tying it in with his childhood. And I think there's something to be said, I think, for, like, A, Ch in Chinese culture, family is, like, really, really important. And I think it's also really important to understand in terms of his story, in terms of, like, where he comes from and how that relates to how his career has progressed. I don't know how I feel about this memoir, to be quite honest with you, because I don't think that it made me like him as a person anymore. Um, in fact, do I think it made me like him less, possibly? Um, let me explain. It's basically that, like, we grew up in very similar areas. Like, there's a lot of overlap in terms of where I grew up and, like, the things I did as a kid and also what he describes as his experience. And, and like, while I was reading it, I appreciate it on one hand because I do think that his memoir was quite honest. But, like, while I was reading it, I was very much like, I would have hated you. If I'd known you while I was growing up, I would have absolutely not been your friend. Um, and I just thought that was really interesting. I did really enjoy the memoir as a whole. Whole, though. I thought that it was well written. I thought that his experience was interesting. The way he talks about, you know, the expectations that are placed on him, not only because he's part of, you know, a Chinese family, but also just in general, I think a lot of immigrant children can relate to this, like, you know, having the hopes and dreams of your parents like placed upon you as a child um, from a very young age. I will say, of course, content warnings for, you know, um, parental abuse. Um, I think that that was like a really interesting topic of conversation. I know that other members of the kind of Chinese diaspora who have read this book have expressed that they don't fully recommend this book because how, of how they feel like it enforces kind of negative stereotypes about Chinese families. I get what they're saying, but at the same time, like, this is someone's experience. I don't feel like you can kind of just say that his experience was the stereotype and therefore it's, like, harmful. I don't know. Like, I feel a little bit weird about that criticism. However, I did want to mention it in case that is something that you want to be aware of going into it. Obviously, there is a stereotype that, like, you know, Chinese parents are abusive to their children, that they don't show affection, etc. And again, I do I feel like this book maybe perhaps perpetuates these stereotypes? Sure. But, like, that is his experience, so, like, I don't think we should invalidate that. I don't know. It's, like, a weird, it's a tricky, tricky situation. Again, this is one of those things where I'm, like, if you're interested in Simu Liu, I think that this would be an interesting read. If you're not interested in him, I don't think that this would be interesting whatsoever. But, yeah, anyway, moving on. Um, the next section I have is, like, literary fiction, so to speak. And the first book I have to talk about is The School for Good Mothers by Jasmine Chan. Um, I read this in a vlog, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. I just wanted to give my final rating. I ended up giving this 3.5 five stars in the end and of course I'll link my vlog where I talk about my initial thoughts about this book. I think this is a good book to be quite honest with you. I think it's a really great debut novel. I definitely liked the first half of the book much more than the second half. I felt like the second half there were definitely some pacing issues in there and I felt like the ending felt a little bit rushed to me as well um, but overall I really liked kind of the it's not satire but like it is a very like 
overt in your face type of commentary, which I thought was like very interestingly done. And I think also though that the atmosphere of the book was really well done. I hesitate to call it a psychological thriller because I feel like that will create some expectations for readers, but in my head, that's how I would classify it as. I think it's one of those books that is like very anxiety inducing. It puts you on edge. It makes you very, very stressed out while you're reading it and intentionally so. And for that reason, I thought that it was well executed, if, if that makes sense. Even if I didn't like the characters, none of the characters are likable. Everyone does reprehensible shit. Um, but I just thought it was like interesting. If you don't know what the book is about, sorry, I keep forgetting to give summaries. This is a sort of like dystopian literary novel where we follow this woman named Frida um, and she's recently been divorced from her husband. She is just really struggling um, and she one day uh, leaves her child at home for a couple of hours and her neighbors call Child Protective Services on her and this starts a whole series of events in which she is now placed under surveillance by the government um, and then she also has to join this program which is a year long and basically they rehabilitate mothers and teach them how to be a good mother basically. Basically. And I think it is interesting. I think it is well executed. I think the commentary, again, is a little like in your face. Um, it's definitely not subtle. Um, so I think if you don't like being like beat over the head with your commentary, you might not like it. But I think for the tone of this book, I think it worked. I don't really have much else to say about this book. Again, I really enjoyed it. I think I gave it 3.5 or 4 stars. I can't remember. I definitely rounded up to a 4, but it's probably like a 3.5 stars for me. And I definitely think it deserves higher ratings on Goodreads. That's all. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. The next one is Joan is Okay by Waikiki Wong. I think I gave this 4.5 or 5 stars. I really, really love this. This is a slice of life um, literary novel about a woman named Joan. Um, she is an ICU doctor, I believe. And basically this book is about Joan going through the day-to-day -day of her life after recently losing her father. And there's a lot that goes on in this book in terms of like what this book is trying to say. But what I think is most interesting is Joan as a character. This is very much a character study of Joan. Um, and again, a slice of life about her life. What I think is interesting about Joan though is this conversation that arises from her character because in a lot of ways she is very much coded to be neurodivergent. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of things about her that are what you would consider like stereotypically Chinese or like Asian. And it's that like Asian cultures are like not as expressive or ro a bit robotic. So it brings up this conversation of like, is she neurodivergent or is she just a product of her culture or both? And I just thought that that was like really interesting. Um, but aside from that, I just thought it was like very well written. It was like very compulsively readable to me for some reason, even though there's zero plot, I could not put this book down. I thought it was so well written. I really loved the exploration between her and her family. Um, she has a brother that she's like sort of estranged from because they didn't really grow up together. Um, and then her relationship with her mother as well. And I just felt like there were just so many moments that like I related to quite a lot in the book. And I really, really enjoyed this book. I think if you're interested in a book that gives you a different take on kind of the, the, Chinese American experience, whatever that might be. I think that this is a really good one to read. I think just think there's a lot in this book that is like very relatable in terms of like what it means to be Chinese American in a more day to day kind of sense. The next book I want to talk about is Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. This is a literary gothic horror sort of. Um, and it's basically a, told in like dual perspective. It's about these two women who are wives shockingly. And one of them is a like marine biologist, I believe. But anyway, she has recently come home from this like deep sea exploration in which her submarine, is that what it's called? The thing? Um, it got stuck at the bottom of the ocean for an extended period of time. And then somehow miraculously, she came back. And this book is told in kind of like dual perspective slash dual timeline in which one perspective is the wife who was the marine biologist. And it's her timeline of what happened to her under the sea. And the other perspective we see is the present day in which I've forgotten her name, but the wife, she's come back home and there's just something off about her. Like she is spending the entire day in the bathroom. She's, you know, going through some like weird, unexplainable biological things. Um, and she's also just not the same person that she was. And through her perspective, you're now seeing what their relationship is like currently, but also where their relationship was 
before. And I gave this book five out of five stars. I thought this was such a great piece of like gothic fiction. I think that this book overwhelmingly the like sensation you get is like claustrophobia. That is the main thing that I think you get from this book both in terms of the claustrophobia of like being under the sea but also the claustrophobia of like being in this relationship that is no longer what you thought it was right and I think that both perspectives are so like suffocating in different ways and I think that it is so beautifully executed um really highly recommend the audiobook for this I really enjoyed this the wife the one who didn't go under the sea I've forgotten her name she's a hypochondriac so I also found that inner dialogue to be far too you know relatable for my liking. I just thought this book was so well written. I really really loved it. Um, I really need to check out this author's um, short story collection. I think that's the only other thing that she has published um, and I really need to get myself a physical copy of this book as well because I just I really love this book. I really really loved it. If you're into gothic fiction I highly recommend this. Even if you're not into gothic fiction I still recommend this. I think this is a really great like kind of modern take on a gothic horror that is not necessarily tied to a house per se but still evokes the same kind of like creepiness and like emotions in you as gothic fiction does. Um, I really really enjoyed this. Um, and then the last book in this category of literary fiction that I read is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. This is of course a very beloved book everywhere, not even just booktube. It is kind of like if you're into dark academia this is like the dark academia I feel um, that people cite. And basically in this book um, we are following our main character Richard? Is that his name? Richard? He's kind of like the outsider kind of character in which he grew up very poor but has always been very like gifted and like interested in like Greek, like the language Greek. But he ends up going to this like elite kind of college um, where he wants to get into like the Greek program. However, in this program there's only five students and like he, once he gets there he's like I can't get into this program, what are you talking about? But in order to get into the program he becomes friends with these like five students who are like super rich, super privileged, um, and they re end up recommending him to the professor and they become like a class of six. Anyway, so what ends up happening is that like right from the very first line of the book, you know that one of the students named Bunny, he's dead. They have somehow killed him. Um, you don't know who killed him. You don't know how he died. And for the first half of the book, the mystery element is like finding out how Bunny died, right? Um, and all while this is all happening, it's just like dark academic, like rich people problems bullshit you know and to be quite honest with you I quite enjoyed the first half of this book I thought it was like very entertaining and I was like I do want to find out how Bunny dies because Bunny is a fucking terrible human being and I want to know if he got what was coming to him you know at around the halfway point that is when Bunny dies in the storyline and then the second half of the book deals more with like how the the remaining five students are dealing with the death of this character and there's more to this book but to be quite honest with you I ended up giving this 1.5 stars. I thought that the entire second half of this book was so fucking boring. So fucking boring. <laughs> Honestly I thought the first half of the book was like a solid three and a half stars kind of maybe a four stars maybe not that far like three and a half stars from the first half of the book but the second half of the book was like hot garbage. It was just so incredibly long and wordy and like boring um and honestly none of the characters are interesting enough to carry this book. I think if the characters were more interesting I would have liked this book a lot more but like none of the characters are interesting to me. Camilla does not have a personality. Her only personality trait is that she's attractive. Um, there's two other guys Charles I believe and Francis they are almost indistinguishable from one another and then there's Henry who is kind of like the leader of the group if you will. Um, he's actually more interesting. I do think he's interesting. I think of all the characters and I think intentionally so he's the only character who's like very self-aware that he's a shitty human being and I think that that makes him very interesting and I just wish that we got more Henry and less of everyone else or that we gave everyone else some more personality. You know what I'm saying? But what I will say is what I did enjoy about this book is kind of that theme of like um, the consequences of like taking aestheticism too far into reality and kind of what happens when you stop being able to distinguish what is real and what is just an aesthetic and I thought that was like a really interesting theme and I thought that that was really well done. Do I think this book does it the best? No. I actually think that like if you are interested in this theme and you want a more concise like a better book, um, The Picture of Dorian Gray also explores this theme and I think does it better to be quite honest with you and I'm sure there's other books but that's the one that like came to my mind. But I what I will say is like 
super interesting and like highly ironic is that this is like the main theme of the book and yet people who have read this book have taken this book and turned it into an aesthetic and I just think that that is so fucking ironic to be quite honest with you and that in and of itself is more interesting than the book itself anyway <laughs> moving on <laughs> The next section is translated fiction, and I read two translated books that I want to talk about here. Uh, the first one is The Cabinet by Eun Soo Kim, which I, again, I have talked about a little bit in a uh, reading vlog. This is a sort of like speculative book, I guess, um, about this man who works as an assistant to this professor in this company, and he has access to this cabinet called Cabinet 13. And in this cabinet are documents um, and like records of all these people around the world who have special abilities basically and basically the book for the most part is um anecdotes about these different people and their different abilities um and then and then also interspersed we start to see a story forming um with the main character i've forgotten his name but him and then his the professor that he works for and kind of re revealing a slightly more like sinister um underlying plot of like why these people exist perhaps and like what people want to do with that information. I don't know if I've explained this book very well. I don't think I have but I also like don't want to give too much away because I feel like the main plot I would say doesn't really happen until like the last third of the book so I don't really want to give too much away. For the bulk of like the first at least half of the book it really does feel more like a short story collection almost of like different stories about these different people and I think that for me, I think I gave this three stars in the end. I think while I was reading it, I never disliked my time. I always enjoyed it. I really think the writing is quite addictive. And so like while you're reading it, it's like pr pretty easy to like fly through it. Um, but at the same time, like once I put it down, I never thought about this book. I don't think it resonated with me in any particular way, but I think it is a really interesting book. And I think that there's a lot of like different ideas and morals like throughout the book that I just don't feel like tied together. I don't even know if they're supposed to tie together because this book is so disjointed and intentionally disjointed. So I don't know if everything was supposed to tie together with like one kind of overarching message, moral of the story kind of, um, or if it just went over my head. Like, I really don't know. I don't know. Um, and so, like I said, I gave this book three stars in the end. I definitely would recommend it, especially if you are into the kind of like category of books that I like to call weird books. Um, this is definitely a weird book. I think if you like those types of books, I think you will really enjoy this. Um, and then the other translated book that I want to talk about is Lonely Castle in the Mirror. This was one of my most anticipated books. I ended up getting an e-arc of it um, because the American edition didn't come out until I think a couple of weeks ago, um, even though it's been out in the UK for most of the year. I feel like this one has gotten a lot of hype, especially on Bookstagram. I feel like I've seen a lot about this. This is basically a portal fantasy sort of, um, and we are following following our main character Kokoro and she is a second year in middle school I believe don't quote me on the exact age um, but she basically has been bullied for the last year or so at school and so as a result she no longer goes to school um, and then one day her mirror starts glowing and she gets sucked into this like magical world and she ends up at this castle where there are I believe six other students so there's seven of them in total and then there's this little girl there wearing a wolf mask and she tells them that they can come into this castle every single day um, from I think it's like nine till five um, and they can stay in the castle have fun like you know do whatever they want um, but then at the end of every day they have to go back to their world and basically they're playing a game where there is like a hidden key somewhere that opens up a room called the wishing room and whoever finds the key and goes into the room has one wish and they can make any wish come true that they want and at the time where someone makes the wish um, this castle will disappear and they will no longer be able to go there or if no one makes a wish and no one finds the key um, then the castle will just disappear as well um, at the end of the school year and it again is like very slice of life feels um, where you're just following the day-to-day -day of these like seven students who all don't go to school um, and they just go to this castle instead um, and you learn about their struggles their issues and there's a lot of discussion about um, mental health in this book as well which I really liked. Ultimately I felt like this book was disappointing. A because I just did have really high expectations for it. I really thought that it was going to be like a new favorite of mine and it really wasn't. Um, I thought that my main issue with it is that it's just extremely predictable. It's very simplistic and maybe it's supposed to be to be fair. I feel like the like plot twist was very obvious from about like a quarter of the way through the book. 
And then, like, by the 40% mark, I was, like, 99% sure of what was going to happen, and that did happen. Um, I don't feel like this book was as emotionally gut-wrenching as people have been saying it has been, and so I think that definitely added to my disappointment of it. Overall, I do still think it's a good book. There are some, like, things about the translation that I didn't love, um, namely that there are certain moments where I'm, like, 90% sure that it has to be a translation note because there's no way that like certain things would be in the Japanese text and if it were it would be weird um so that's in, in and of itself like a weird thing but like I just think that stuff like that should just be a footnote like it should just be in a translator's note it shouldn't be like in interwoven into the text personally um but that kind of bothered me a little bit but it's not it's not super prevalent it was just like a few moments where I was like mm, I don't know about this but yeah overall I just didn't feel like this had the emotional impact that I was expecting it to I think that if you connect to the characters more I think that if you connect to the story more I think that the kind of impact of the kind of plot twist so to speak was not impactful for me again because I was just expecting it and I was just like waiting for it to happen I don't know I feel bad giving this like a slightly negative review and again I don't think my review is negative I still gave this book like three stars I think um but I just don't feel like it was the life-changing book that like people have been telling me it's going to be and so I just unfortunately was disappointed because of the hype if you know what I mean and then the last section I have is, of course, fantasy. And shockingly, I only have one book to talk about here, and that is The Empress of Time by Kylie Lee Baker. I can't really say too much about this because this is the second book in a duology, um, but this is the sequel to The Keeper of Night by Kylie Lee Baker, um, which is one of my favorite books of last year, so I will link one of many videos that I've talked about it already. But this is a story about Ren, who is a half Shinigami, half Reaper. Um, she has spent, like, a century or maybe two centuries, I don't remember, but she spent, like, most of her life in... In, um, England and because of a series of events she's found herself needing to flee from um, England and she goes to the only other place that she knows she might belong and that is Japan. So she and her half-brother Neven um, they travel to Japan and once she lands in Japan she meets the goddess of death and she wants to prove herself as a like a, a Shinigami in in their society like their Shinigami society and she gets sent on this like quest to go and kill these three demons um and that is basically the premise of the first book I don't really want to say much else book two picks up 10 years I believe after the end of book one and to be quite honest that time skip is like almost irrelevant because 10 years in the lifespan of like a, a, an immortal is like nothing and also plot wise there's not really like much progression in these 10 years I will say that I didn't love book two quite as much as book one like book one was an easy five stars for me book two was like a four star for me I feel like it was definitely a little bit repetitive I think that if you've read book one book two is very much a lot of the same thing again she's like found herself on a quest she's meeting all these different demons um and she's finding herself having to uh complete these tasks right it has that very kind of like quest fantasy feel to it um I really enjoyed it because I really enjoyed book one I really enjoy kind of the dark fantasy vibes of this book I really enjoy the Japanese folklore that's woven throughout and again one of the standouts to me in book one was the relationship between her and her brother and I think that that carries over to book two and exploring that relationship further and exploring kind of the tensions between her and her brother I thought that was really well done. I thought that the ending was like pretty satisfying um, and overall I really really enjoy this duology a lot. I really recommend it if you enjoy folklore based stories but especially kind of more darker uh, folklore based stories. I really really recommend this book. I will say that my least favorite part of both books is definitely the romance. It's a little like forced. It's a little contrived. It's not my favorite thing. It doesn't like negatively impact my enjoyment or anything like that but for me it doesn't really add anything either so make of that what you will make of that what you will but with that said that is it for this video that is it for this recent reads this may be the longest one I've ever filmed so if post editing this is the longest one I've ever posted I apologize for that but yeah that is it for today thank you so much for watching as always I super appreciate it uh, and if you like this video please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and comment down below let me know what you have read recently that are standouts to you and if you've read any of the books that I've read let me know what you thought about them and if you like this video and you want to see more from me please don't forget to hit the subscribe button that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next time.